Welcome everyone. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to those joining us around the world. I'm Lily Mackley. I'm with the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. I'm really, really delighted to be hosting today's discussion on China's demographic picture. This is the ninth public event that we've held under the auspices of the Interpret China program here at CSIS. The Interpret China project uh, was launched earlier in 2022 with gracious funding from the Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. The intention is to enable a more productive and nuanced discussion of China's rise through the translation and dissemination of primary source materials. And as part of that, we've been translating a handful of documents uh, around the focus of today's discussion, which is China's demographic picture. And you can find those on the Interpret China website, which is just interpret csis.org, um, as well as linked on the webpage for this event. China's demographic picture has really captured headlines in recent years, uh, particularly since uh, the Ch uh, China just recently experienced negative population growth for the first time, continuing a trend of declining population growth. And this year, India's population is projected to overtake China. So this, this topic is really in the news. And many people are familiar with China's historic one-child policy, but less familiar with the broad set of dynamics that are uh, shaping a falling birth rate and the emerging Chinese policy responses for addressing this change in the associated challenges of a smaller workforce and an aging population. Today's discussion will explore these topics um, and to do so, we really have an all-star panel. This is truly an all-star panel, I'm so glad. Um, so from, from, from the left on my screen, uh, we have Alice Chung, who's a research fellow at Academia Sinica, is joining us from Taiwan. We have Yuan Zhou, who's assistant professor of sociology and Chinese studies at the University of Michigan. We have Carl Minzer, who's a professor of law at Fordham University Law School, and Stuart Edelbaston, who is a professor of social science at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and Khalifa University in the UAE. Thank you so much all for joining us today. To start off our discussion, I've asked our panelists to each sort of share their thoughts on what we can glean partially from these documents, partially from what they read on a daily basis as experts on this topic into how Beijing is diagnosing the causes and consequences of a falling birth rate. Um, and later we'll dig into emerging policy responses. So. Um, if it's all right, given how late it is over there, uh, I'll turn to Alice first, um, and then we'll go to Stuart to start us off. Alice, over to you. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I think based on the documents we uh, uh, shared uh, with the panelists here, I think there are several points um, that Beijing is um, co uh, correct in the sense of uh, diagnosing the situation. These include um, they're trying to support young parents to raise kids and try to alleviate their financial burden. And then they sense the, the, uh, the necessity to um, uh, transform the, the their um, economic um, uh, activities and the, the importance of industrial upgrading and others, including the, the, um, the uh, long-term care insurance or medical care or pension system that's that's very um, uh, critical to a very uh, rapidly aging society. So these are uh, in their um, plan to sort of combat the, the rapidly approaching um, aging reality. Um, and also they are think, also thinking about importing um, immigrants to um, to to make use of their human resources I think these are all um, uh, correct uh, direction to go but um, what they are uh, sort of uh, missing out in their plans um, I, I think there are um, five points in my view first of all I think um, the the idea that they are trying to uh, promote this quote unquote traditional Chinese virtue, um, is actually going against uh, what's causing the rapidly declining fertility rates. Um, it's right because the traditional value sort of um, uh, uh, created this uh, very uh, strong gender inequality and then the, the, um, the kind of burden that women have to face when they have both uh, family and career. Uh, that's in conflict. So 
really promoting this without a, a, a substantive improvement uh, in sort of um, changing the the uh, the way how women can balance um, the, the the demands from their family and um, workplace. Um, these the, the, you know more needs to be done. So it's not simply this um, you know promoting ch Chinese traditional virtue, and then. Along with this line, um, they also want to advocate the "quote unquote" appropriate age to have, uh, to to get married and to have children, and so these really ignore the fact that um, as more and more and more Chinese women who are progressing faster in terms of their educational um, um, achievement than men, this is not really um, what they are envisioning in the future. Um, the, the natural consequence of uh, women's improvement in education is, is definitely later marriage and later childbearing. So how do we help them um, uh, you know, balance their needs and uh, you know, in, uh, to, to form a family and also to accomplish their, their personal goals? These are important. That it's not really trying to fix their clock to a right um, um, schedule. So I think this is not really helping, um, helping with the problem that the, the Chinese uh, young adults are facing. And then um, the, the policy that's being laid out also ignore the rapid growth of um, young adults who have no partners. Um, and the, the, uh, the fact that marriage, uh, uh, the ma registered marriages have been declining very rapidly over the past eight years or so. So why are people not marrying, or do they um, uh, do they actually have a partner uh, with them uh, to to uh, you know in their in you know uh, to to form families, or be, or is it because they uh, or, or the delay of marriage is due to financial reason, I, I think a, a lot of these need more research. So this part is being ignored. Rather, the, the pronatalist policy that's being put forth has been, you know, mostly focused on how to help parents who, who, who are already planning to have kids or who already have one or two kids to help them, you know, um, um, uh, make ends meet. Uh, so this part is also missing from the the the, the um, discussion, and the fact that uh, the one child policy has been uh, had had been impl uh, implemented for nearly four decades, it also changed the younger generation's ideal family size. So how how many of them is willing to have two kids or three kids is a big question mark, and. Um, this part needs to be um, explored more. And finally, the last uh, factor I think needs to be taken into account is um, um, why marriage has become less appealing to young adults, particularly women. And if this is not um, thoroughly explored, I think a lot of the policy that's being put out will not be effective in the end. Thank you so much, Alice. That's a really excellent way to start us off a uh, very broad overview and I really appreciate it. And we'll certainly get into how um, this compares to the situation we're seeing in other countries and also what this indicates about uh, Beijing's approach to governance later. But I certainly want to get Stuart and um, then we'll go to Yuan for, for opening thoughts on this question. Stuart, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Lily. And, and I, I think, yeah, Alice, I think, has really um, uh, put a finger on, on many of the, the kind of issues, I think, that, that I would have mentioned as well. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think I'll probably just take a, a step back and look at the, at the, the, the whole kind of paradigm, if you will, the way that this population issue is being presented in these documents. And to me, I think the the, the issue is it's really a series of kind of mixed messages. It, it feels like there's a lot of mixed messages going around at the moment. Now, in fairness, this is not unique to China, right? I think that that all countries which are going through low fertility at the moment are struggling with how do we approach this issue, right? That do we see it as a problem that we need to fix, and therefore we're going to have pronatalism? Let's have more babies. 
or are we seeing this actually as a symptom of other downstream issues, right? That, that there is a, a rejection. Why is there a rejection of childbirth? Why is there a rejection of marriage, right? Why is there um, this, um, this, this, why is childbearing and family formation going from being what what might be called a cornerstone of life to being a capstone of life, right? To being a part of a bigger project rather than everything, right? Um, and then, of course, that is going to affect how governments and how different stakeholders are going to respond to that, right? Do we always saying, okay, just have more babies, but then, of course, more babies don't really fix things, but more babies are not going to fix the pension system, or babies are not going to increase productivity, right? Babies don't work, as I as I often say, right? Um, or do we see this low fertility issue as being rather a lens to look at these bigger challenges in society, right? As a downstream consequence, this this break, this this gap between fertility preferences um, and reality. Um, and so in that case, then you know, rather than being the problem, low fertility becomes a symptom. And then therefore, we are actually looking at policies to increase productivity, to improve well-being, to enable everybody to maximize their full potential in society. And then fertility rates are a kind of or a byproduct um, of that down the line. Now, again, this is this is something which I think many, many countries around the world are challenged, are, are dealing with at the moment. And that's obviously because with population, you have many different stakeholders involved. If you're an economist or if you're in the labor ministry, you just want more people, right? You just want more babies. It's as simple as that. If you're in the health department, if you're in social welfare or, or, or um, um, you know, some other kind of departments like that, you're going to look at this in a completely different way. You're going to look at this more from a kind of bottom up way right so i think that the, the fact that we that population and demography is a cross-cutting issue also doesn't help this kind of doesn't enable clarity or doesn't support clarity and we can see this mixed messaging in the documents right in the framing of the document so on the one hand we've got documents saying you know we are supporting reproductive aspirations we will do what we can to support people to have the number of children that they want which when you think about it, it's kind of like amazing to, to consider that the, that language compared to where we have been in the not too distant past and also kind of where we still are today but that's not followed through right that on the other hand there's still these flashes of alarmism right there's still um the 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 the, the underlying pro natalist yeah you, know, you can have the number of children you want as long as you have more right it seems to be that this underlying kind of narrative and and again as you know i'm sure many people will have seen the you know the uh, um the reports of uh, the the address to the all china women's federation last week and there's this this was clearly about creating a new kind of, you know, a, well, a new old Chinese uh, family, which inevitably involves uh, earlier marriage and involves more children, right? So I think that that mixed messaging is difficult. And then similarly with the policy responses, right? On the one hand, yes, yes, of course, childcare is important and these things matter. But if the childcare doesn't link up to work culture or to gender roles at home or to um uh, or to the expectations around uh, what your children are going to do we learned this from korea which spent an enormous amount of money on ch on child care but because it wasn't of a sufficient enough quality and the expectations around child rearing and, and education are so high it didn't really do anything and also it wasn't mapped on to to work culture as well so i think i mean i know we'll talk more about policy later but again it's like why do you have child care do you have child care so people can have more babies or do you have childcare because childcare is an important component in work-life culture, in work life, in work family balance, in enabling everybody to fully engage in the labour market, and then fertility and childbearing is a downstream consequence of that. So it's just, and again, let me just be very clear: China is definitely not the only place in the world which is not joining up um, all of these different threads of the of the kind of low fertility puzzle and and not really even like what is the point of population policy is it top-down control or is it bottom-up 
enabling, or is it a little bit both? And you know, and 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 unsurprisingly, I think that there is some confusion in these documents about that. Fantastic, thank you, Stuart. I like your point about how the policy responses we see will line up directly with how we're diagnosing the problem. Is it a top-down issue, or is it? really something that we need to deal with other things aside from childbirth first to induce that. Um, I want to give everyone a chance to just have opening remarks. So Yuan, we'll uh, go over to you uh, um, for your interesting perspectives. And then Carl, I'll give you a, a chance to jump in for, for any final thoughts here on this question. All right. Um, thank you, Lily. I want to echo what my colleagues have said and highlight that China's population governance measures and efforts have been building on two assumptions. One, that population size can be designed and engineered. And two, family and private lives can be monitored right down to the minutia. Yet we know that both assumptions do not hold but both assumptions are in line and are consistent with the current CCP underseas governing logic. That is a heavy grip on all aspects of Chinese society that is at the same time overbearing and micromanaging. The most recent birth incentivizing measures that we have seen coming out of China treat women's reproductive labor as a duty, both for the prosperity of her family and for her country. So in this sense, Chinese women are caught between the patriarchal familial demand that treat marriage and childbearing still very much as normative, and also at the hand of the authoritarian state's pro-natalist push. And as China increasingly confronts the twin challenges of economic stagnation and population aging, Chinese women are facing the increasing dual demands of being, quote, productive labor and nurturing mothers. But what we are seeing is just Chinese women, some Chinese women saying no. Yet, so long as China's birth incentivizing measures continue to treat women as the baby makers for the family and for the nation, the no will become ever more resounding. So what happens? when China's growth slows and its birth very likely can't rebound. Being the world's most populous country is, has long been fundamental to how China, both its leadership and its people, see itself and its place in the world. So as this outlook towards such a future becomes murkier, it has profound implications for not just China's domestic politics and policies, but it's foreign politics and policies as well. So in this sense, let's take a step back and ask, what does Beijing want? I think we should not forget that China's population control has long had an eugenic undertone to it. And Xi's recent speeches in industrial northeastern China highlights the need for, quote, new high quality productive force, xin zhi sheng chan li. And let's not forget the expulsion of the so-called low-end population under Xi. So does Beijing want population growth or does Beijing want population upgrade? This is a first order question we need to examine closely. Fantastic, Yun, you've given us so much to think about. Carl, I wanna to turn to you just for some initial reactions to what you've heard so far. Sure, I'll just, I'll try to, <clears throat> And give some framing that pulls in all the great points that the other that that uh, that Stuart Yun and uh, Alice all, all brought out. I mean, th when I look at the documents that you circulated, um, some of them uh, actually remind me of things that I've seen elsewhere in East Asia. I mean, basically throughout East Asia, whether Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, or now China, as each of these societies has hit a point where they realize that demography is going to be a problem, it looks to me like you see uh, state actors uh, basically freak out and start to think, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with the emerging problems? In Japan, this was in the 1990s. In Taiwan and South Korea, it was the early 2000s. And for China, it looks to me like it was in about 2021 and right now. And the policies that all of these, all the governments and all these, all, all these countries adopt is to sort of do exactly what Stuart mentioned is sort of we migrate towards pronatalism and we try to push or we try to figure out how we incentivize 
people to have births. And some of those things, oh, this is where, you know, Stuart and I, I, I completely agree. It's, you know, some of the things, there, there's an element of, there can be an element of good in that, in which you sort of create opportunities for for uh, people to uh, to assist them to make choices that are appropriate for their own lives, to uh, increase parental leave, to begin to try to support people, uh, you know, in some societies, make IVF more available. That's more debatable, debatable in, in many East Asian countries. But that's what many of these East Asian governments attempt to do. Now, what, what happens in all, all of East Asia is these measures don't actually make that much difference. Uh, sort of the per birth rates throughout East Asia sink to the lowest of the low, and really, like, literally the lowest the lowest in the world the five lowest societies in the world are all uh it's macau hong kong china south korea taiwan uh south korea taiwan yes i mean and, and those are i mean the lowest one south korea macau uh it's below all below japan which is like 10th from the bottom and the uh and and the key thing that they bump up against is the social realities the gender uh entrenched gender inequality which alice and Yun have talked about uh, and so this is the situation China finds itself. I think it's going to find itself in is as well. And so what worries me is, and this is the other component, is that I see an emerging policy response that's starting to come out of uh, Beijing, which looks to me like it's figuring out how do we target women. And for precisely the reasons that Alice and Yun articulated, I'm worried about what I see emerging in this sort of unclear policy environment. You know, Beijing's developing its talking points it's developing as policies and i'm concerned about what this is going to mean for women as parties the party goes forward but we can get into the details later i'll just stop there fantastic thank you carl um so several of you have brought up the idea that Ch beijing is essentially targeting maybe the wrong thing or not it not targeting the problem comprehensively enough right we're targeting falling birth rates when maybe we need to be targeting broader issues such as the social social realities, broader gender equality issues. That's something that has was brought up several times in the articles. Gender equality. I think one of the articles talked about raising socioeconomic levels across Chinese society, um, but that doesn't also seem to line up with the emphasis on young women having babies at the appropriate age, right? So there's this disparity between maybe what we're seeing in terms of the recognition of some of the broader challenges from these Chinese expert pieces and uh, how Beijing is actually targeting the problem. So I'm wondering if we can, before we get over to the comparative side, if we can flip to emerging policy responses that we're seeing from Beijing. Um, I definitely want to go to you, Carl. Uh, I can start you off for this one because I know that you've done some writing on this um, and what it's telling us about uh, maybe not just Beijing's response to this question, but also its uh, general governance approach uh, more broadly. So, Carl, I'll start with you, um, and then uh, I'll go turn to, uh, to to Yuan and Stuart, and then we'll move to Alice for the comparative side. All right, I'll, I'll try to, I mean, I try to be even sort of as even handed as I can. I'm sort of trying to say that, you know, look, I agree that there are some, if you look at the documents and you look at what, 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 what you see coming out in terms of what Chinese authorities say, there, you know, you'll see things like increased support for kindergarten and some increased support for early childhood education, increased uh, parental leave, uh, better medical care for uh, pronatal. Uh, pro so it's not, these aren't bad things. These are good things. They're very similar that, to things that you would have, you see in Taiwan. If you go to Taipei right now, there's a lot of infrastructure for young children that was built out in the early 2000s, but that ended up not actually getting used because birth rates just went, you know, incredibly low. Um, and so I think part of what I see is very similar policies, uh, you know, efforts to encourage people to take, you know, maternity leave and paternity leave. And so some of that is that that looks that looks in some ways good. Um, so I, while giving some Chinese authorities credit for that, I, I think what I am worried about is what Alice referenced uh, as well, is that I see this, the, 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 the language, so it's not just the Women's Federation, there was there, the, the speech, but Xi Jinping, you know, uh, about two weeks ago, he gave a speech, it's the once in a f every five years, you have the National Women's Congress that meets. This party speech to that Congress since the 1990s, sort of the party document which goes there has always included the line some version of male female equality is a 
core fundamental state policy that was in, in there in 1998. It was in there in 2003, 2008, 2013, 2018. It's gone now. This, I think, it pairs up with exactly what Alice was saying about the traditional Chinese values. I think at a deep level within the Chinese state, there's kind of this question going on of what's the problem with our society with respect to to demography, to gender. And I worry that what's happening is the parties begin, some, not everybody, but there's a discussion, but it's it's at a high level now. I mean, that's not just a random official. That's a clear signal from the top that's beginning to pivot in the direction of, the problem is women are not taking the lead in family formation. And that's the other language that was in the speech, the Women's Congress, was this stuff about, you know, new culture of women, of childbirth, new culture of marriage, and I'll quote the language from the documents you circulated. It was, this is Wang Peian, executive vice president of the Chinese Family Planning Association. We advocate for marriage and childbearing at the appropriate age, which means encouraging young people to do what they should do at certain life stages, to date when it is time to date, to get married when it is time to marry, to have children when it is time to get have children. I see that and I'm really worried because that looks to me like an emerging state policy of like starting to be like, well, should we have targets? Should women be understanding that they should be getting married earlier? Is it good for people to be having advanced degrees? And in a state like China, this could go, you could imagine a ways, a, a whole range of ways, which dials even before you start saying, well, you must have children, but the levers could be triggered against women's education or employment that could have some real serious impacts on women. So while giving credit for some of the good policies, and I totally agree with Stuart that, you know, there's different, China's big, there are lots of different views out there, but I'm worried about what I see because of what it could mean for where the state might go vis-a-vis -vis women. Sorry. No, fascinating. Thank you, Carl. You had reactions to that? Absolutely. Um, Carl, I agree with you. And I think also one thing that I want to highlight is there's always this disjunctures and difference between the policy on paper vis-a-vis -vis the policy in practice. So even with the work family policies, even with in cash incentives, even with the provision of childcare, to what extent are those policies translatable or translated from, from, from paper to actual practice? And how do Chinese individuals react to them? So I remember uh, when I was doing interviews um, in China about women and men's fertility decision making, one theme that was uh, keep coming up is, oh, we know about these policy change. We know about this discussions about incentivizing childcare. But to quote one of my interview, policy from CCP can be issued in the morning and changed at night. Zhao Ling Xi Gai. So to that extent, it also reflects a deep distrust about how individuals see what are the policy that are available to them or what are the benefits of social welfare that are available to them that they can fully access. So we, we know in this sense, you know, childbearing or, you know, to have a child, to not have a child is a deeply and inherently future orienting act. And there is a piece particular to China that is how do we understand population or how do we understand people's family decisions as they also navigate this sense of uncertainty that is quite unique to lives under authoritarianism. So how do individuals place their trust or the lack thereof in the policies that are being touted as um, or being being promoted. I think that kind of disjuncture, disjuncture between, you know, the policies that are available on paper vis-a-vis -vis the policies that are um, or the good good policies in course or um, access in, in, in practice. I think that disjuncture is what um, we also need to look closely at. Fantastic. Um, Stuart, reactions from you? Yeah, I think it's I, I think it's very important. I I I I agree with you. And I, I think that you know when we look at family policy, and 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 again, I guess it's thinking about how effective these these interventions are going to be, these policies are going to be. When we look at family policies around the world, how effective they've been, a big part of that is like what is their actual goal, right? What is the outcome, the desired outcome of these family policies? So this is about the framing of this. And we know that policies which are framed around supporting people to reach their aspirations 
are going to be more successful than policies which are telling people what to do for some greater good because people don't have children to save the pension system people don't have children to increase productivity people have children as a consequence and people don't have children because a poster on the street tells them to have children people have a ch have children because of a myriad because of myriad different uh, interactions, decisions, situations, relationships, whether they're in love, whether they fall out of love, whether they've got a small house, a big house, they've got a car, they've got a job, they've got a pet, everything, right? And so that, I think that framing is important, but then also the consistency, exactly as you said, the, the, this, the consistency of a policy, like, okay, all right, fine, maybe the government is gonna support me and I will go ahead and have, have my children. Now, of course, another thing as well, a bit geeky demographic thing, family policies, pronatalist policies, almost always only change when people have children, not how many children they actually have, right? Um, so there's almost no examples in the world, very, very few examples in the world where family policy or pronatalist policy has actually changed the, the quantum of children rather than just the template. But anyway, that's a very geeky thing we can get into um, uh, uh, as an aside. But when you look at the places which have kind of relatively consistent cohort fertility rates and somewhat higher, they're the places which have had consistent family policy paradigms for years and years and years, like France or Sweden or places like this, right? If you're not, if you're not sure what's going to happen, if things are changing all the time, it's going to be very difficult for you to make this big decision, which is a life, which is a life decision. And then I think the last thing I would just say is, is um, policies and these interventions, they need to be in, and this goes, I think, to what Alice was saying before, that policies need to be in sync with reality, right? Um, and that, and, and I feel sometimes with, I think particularly many observers of, of, of China around the world is this, I mean, this goes back, I'm, I'm opening a kind of hornet's nest here about what the one child policy actually did, right? And if we believe that if it wasn't for the one child policy, then there would be 400 million extra births in China and the one child policy is the be all and end all, which puts the fertility rate down in China and that's the end of it. Then we might well say, well, then the, the other, the reverse can be the, the case as well, right? We have a, a big policy which is going to come in and we're the birth control, we can have a, the opposite of the birth control policy and the fertility rate will just jump up again. But of course, this is not the case, right? There were plenty of other things which happened in China in the 70s and 80s and 90s, which interacted with fertility, uh, I, I, I'm, you know, which, which interacted with fertility decision making. You know, we we know that yes, of course, the birth control policies which were brought in and had all kinds of different consequences and whatever, but at the same time as urbanization, as industrialization, as improved health, the conditions were already there for smaller families anyway. At the moment, the conditions seem to be in place for very small families, for keeping for, for the fertility rate to stay low. The conditions are in place, as Alice mentioned, for marriage to actually be postponed or you know, for, for childlessness, maybe child-free culture to even increase. Against that, the kind of policies that Carl is talking about would have to be extremely, I would say, extremely heavy handed because they are going against the grain in a sense, in, 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 in the opposite way to how I think policies in the 70s and 80s and 90s were going with the grain, if that makes sense. Definitely. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I have a few follow-up questions, if if you don't mind, on uh, on this issue. I, I really liked the idea uh, that I think all of you brought up about consistency uh, and consistency of policy being really important to set expectations uh, in the longer term and create a comfort level. And the comparison with France is really interesting. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think one issue as well is that uh, just throwing money at the problem, especially when it's, you know, individual sums that may not move the needle very much in people's decision making about whether to have a child um, is is really maybe not uh, addressing the broader social issues that are that are uh, driving this challenge. And I'm just wondering, um, 
if maybe I could hear, and Alice, feel free to jump in as well, um, but maybe I'll go back to Carl uh, on this issue uh, first, is is there any, what would you have Beijing do, uh, if, if, if you don't mind me putting it that bluntly, of what is, what, what is the key thing that you think that Beijing could do to really address this challenge? I'll echo some of the things that I think I've you know I've heard other people say is that first you got to figure out is what's the problem is the, is the problem that you know we just have too few children and we need to sort of bump up and that the real problem might be the effects of what's taking place which would be pensions it's who's going to take care of the elderly it's you know there's a range of social challenges and what you're saying is well, how how are we going to deal with this going forward? And you can look at Taiwan, you can look at South Korea, you can look at other countries, and you can sort of say, well, one of the ways in which those societies have dealt with it, and Taiwan has tried to move the needle for like 15 or 20 years without significantly affecting it one way or the other. But what they've started to do, for example, is rely on in immigrants in the sense of it's not called immigrants, but it's guest workers who are coming in to fill sort of cer certain niches, particularly elder care, which would otherwise go unaddressed. And so there are ways in which you can respond to the result of a, you know, a rapidly aging population with declining fertility that might help you address some of the social consequences. If you that so that would be that, that would probably be one of the, the top things that I would I would point to. Um, I'll defer to the others on in terms of specific policies with, with respect to birth rates, if people want to play with that. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, Yuan, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you, but I also want to ask you a, a separate question as well, if you don't mind. I want to get your reactions to what Carl said um, in his remarks about how Beijing is dealing with this problem. Um, you know, he talked about um, the, the trade off issue and this really top down. I, I thought it was striking about your comment, Carl, about um, about male female equality not appearing in the latest statement. And I'm just wondering, you speak to a lot of people on the ground with your interviews and everything. Uh, you had, what's the public reaction to this so far? Yes. Um, so, what would I wish Beijing would do? Perhaps to put it glibly, I would wish it's not a bunch of men making decisions about women's bodies or what women um, should or should not do. I always, um, I'm deeply influenced by, you know, the black feminist thoughts on reproductive justice, which highlights both the right to not have children, the right to have children, especially for those who have historically been marginalized and face eugenic assumptions about whether they are they're fit or their ability to be parents. But also this idea of once you become a parent, you, you have the right or the ability to parent with dignity. And I think the right to have children um, is deeply fraught as we consider China's his, uh, contemporary China's histories in population governance. So for, um, in relation to the right to have children um, there, so access to IVF for people that are outside of the heterosexual uh, marriage unions. But also this idea, you know, once you become a parent, you you have the social safety net, you have the access to social welfare that allow you to parent with dignity. So one thing that was really, really striking um, from my on the ground interviews, um, once the universal two child policy went into effect, was this um, people grappling with, you know, who gets to become a parent, who has the right to to have a second child, who are who by having a second child um, is almost like engaging a moral feeling, a failing. So the idea of if you're poor, you shouldn't have a second child, or if you're rural, why do you have a second child? So that all gets intertwined um, within the current state's narrative about the correct family behavior, values, the correct ideas um, toward marriage and um, um, dating and childbearing. So it just becomes, um, in some sense, mutually reinforcing to the point that it creates other forms of social exclusions. And often those social exclusions are deeply intertwined with China's existing inequalities, be it rural-urban, be it gender, be it ethnic, um, be, it, be it sexuality. Fantastic, thank you. And, 
Um, Alice, I'm wondering if I could turn to you for uh, your assessment of kind of the the ground level reaction to some of these policies that we're seeing emerging uh, um, in terms of young adults. Okay, I'm wondering, and maybe I don't know whether Yun has answer to this, because in the case of Taiwan and Japan, the really pressing issue is that among the all the, the single men and women who are in their marriageable ages, a growing population is not having a partner. So we just finished, uh, in the case of Taiwan, we just finished a large, uh, it's not large, 10,000 10, respondents, consider me, me, medium size, um, survey um, that interviewed um, um, men and women between the age of 20 to 49. So um, I think maybe half of them, or maybe slightly more than half of them, were never married men and women. So among these never married men and women from age 20 to 49, there's a question that asks them, do you currently have a, a, a dating partner? What, what, what's your relationship status? Uh, option one, I have a stable relationship. Option two, I have someone who I date. Option three, I have neither. You know how big of a share of these never married population answer three? 60 to 70 percent across hmm. the board across the board and then another question is how many stable relationships have you ever had about 25 percent a quarter of all these never married populations said they never had a stable relationship a quarter from late 20s to late 40s for the early 20s is higher because they are younger okay um but it's striking. The statistic is striking. So before any policy is, are, you know, is going to be effective, you have to make sure the population you are tar targeting has someone they can have babies with. You know, <laughs> a lot of them are not even partnered. They, 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 they are living by themselves or they, they, they don't have an intimate relationship. So what's going on? And from my own view, and also I think this is shared in Japan and Korea and to some extent, you know, um, working hours are too long. And, you know, in the new um, knowledge economy, people are, are really stressed from their work. And whenever they have time, they just want to lay flat. They don't want to do anything. And relationship is energy and time consuming. And even when you put in a lot of thoughts and time, it, it does not always you know, lead to anything. So I wonder what the situation is like in China. Is, is the growing unmarried population also is uh, composed of a huge chunk of um, young adults without any partner? Yuan, can I get your thoughts on <laughs> some of what Alice has said? Yeah, absolutely. I think the in the case of mainland China, there are two things I think um, worth highlighting. One is let's not forget about China's deeply imbalanced sex ratio. So um, as a uh, result of um, the sex selection under the one, one child policy regime. So even if marriage sorting happens randomly, there are still uh, leftover men just by mathematically there are more men than women. At, marriage age. And a second thing that I think worth highlighting is normatively, or what is viewed as um, individuals um, desired um, sequence of marriage and childbearing, uh, marriage is still by and large viewed as the desirable or the normative precondition and context in which childbearing happens. So this goes back to Alice's point about, as we think about low fertility, it's really three transitions. The first transition into marriage, the, then, the, then the transition into first birth, and then the transition into second and 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 higher order birth, and I think that's um, the two things that um, similar or worth worth mentioning about mainland China. And Alice, I I love your point about the overwork, and I think it's um, worth remembering that between the family and the state, there's still the market 
and the labor market. So what are the labor market conditions? What are the labor market norms? How, what are the expectations that will place on workers, on ideal workers that also have deep implications for family behavior? So family policies aside, labor, labor policies um, in themselves will have their effect on, on fertility as well. That makes complete sense. Um, and yeah, Stuart, we'll love your thoughts here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up exactly what you're saying. I, I think that, you know, again, this comes back down to what I was trying to get out before, which is whether you see low fertility as a problem or as the kind of downstream consequence of these, of precisely these kind of issues. I mean, and I, I, I think that low fertility or this low fertility issue or very low fertility or at least the gap between ideals and reality i think it's a reflection of a, a crisis among youth i think it's a, a genuine crisis among young people that you know you, you imagine right so you, you know you're growing up you're on you're put under an enormous amount of pressure an enormously high expectations for you to achieve the best you can in a in, in a in a tough education system then you go out into the labor market right this is there's a reason why the unemployment rates are what they are right this is a very very rough labor market and it's getting it's getting rougher you want to get a house god luck you want to get a house in a tier one city forget about it right this is all of these challenges about getting started in life is really really tough you want to get even you want to think about dating not i mean like even the, just the, the physical cost of a wedding let alone everything else that leads up to it right all of this package is really really difficult then you find a job the job that you find is going to be pretty fragile right that, that you're not this is not a job for life right this is going to you're going to be uh, um looking over your shoulder uh, all the time um and so therefore, uh, and of course, if you're, if you have a child and if you are a woman, um, then the risk associated with, with having a child, and, and let's say it's not just that having a child, but it's the marriage package, right? The risk associated with, um, have taken on care roles for parents and for parents in law, right? All of this kind of package is going to come together there. If you marry the wrong guy, and it turns out that the the guy you you were dating is like, oh yeah, I'm going to help around the house and do equal work, and I'm going to be a nice guy. And then he marries, and then you get married, and it's like, yeah, I'm done now. That's it. This is your business, right? The risk associated with that, if you're in a decent job, the risk of getting that marriage wrong or of the of of childbearing is is tremendously high. It's tremendously high. So therefore, it's a natural response to just say, well, I'm not going to do it. Or if I am going to do it, I'm going to do it once. Because fundamentally it goes back to why people have children. And most of the reasons you can think of why people have children can be met with in a very low mortality setting, demography, with one child. So you have one child and that's it. So, and again, that's where if you say about, well, what, what do I want Beijing to do? It would be to listen to these concerns of, of young people, right? It would be to look to to, to explore the what, what why why are we in this situation? And and as you mentioned, the people who know why we're in this situation is not us, but it's twenty and twenty five and thirty year old people, you know, living across China. They will tell you very happily tell you uh, why we're in this situation and what they need from not only the government, but from their employers, from their partners, from their families, from their parents-in-law, from their community, in order to support their reproductive aspirations, whatever that, which should, which can, which should be respected, whatever they may well be. Maybe I'll, I'll follow just on, on what Stuart was saying is I, I think I think all three of you guys have sort of nailed exactly the the, the the key issue, one of one of the key issues here. And just to build on what Stuart said, I mean, I, I also think about it from the standpoint of he was listing what would what are you feeling as a as a young person? And so I think you also get if you think about the male component of it, you get this sense of also like, in addition, I can't have all this and I can't have I can't find a girlfriend. I can't get married. 
And then there's this anger that builds up. And this is why I find South Korea so interesting, because I think one of the things that's, and correct me if I'm wrong, you guys have studied Asian, a range of Asian countries more than I have. But what I hear from people who work on this is that the palpable sense among the Korean youth, you're seeing sort of support for sort of, it's the feminist problem. The problem is those women, they, you know, they have these ideals and, you know, they won't date me. They don't like this and they won't. And in the fault that all the anger is kind of channeled at the women, this seems to be building in South Korea. I never understood why not in Taiwan. The two, those two societies seem to be going utterly different directions on this particular issue. But I, I sense that building up in a social environment in South Korea where it's just the fault is somebody's, the men, the men, young men feeling that. What worries me is I feel that's happening in democratic society just with social norms. And I, the where, where the bridge is to China is I think I could see the same thing building up in China. And the thing that worries me is I see an all-male Politburo having to deal with social unrest, having to deal with who's to blame for all of these issues. And now I see a so I see a party that is starting to say women need to understand X. And then all of a sudden I can very easily imagine this isn't just a social reaction on the part of young men. It starts to become a voice that's beginning to come out of the party itself as to whose fault it is. And that's where I can see a lot more problems beginning to crop up. Uh, anyway, that's me, my journey into sort of like how, where this could potentially go, which is why I, I, I'm very interested in South Korea in terms of what's happening there. But I'm also interested in why, why does Taiwan not give me that sense? Because I'm looking at those two as sort of potential comparisons vis-a-vis -vis China. Thanks. Well, thank you. Alice, I think this is a perfect opportunity for me to turn to you and just um, some of your comparative research and research on Taiwan. Do you have any sense of kind of the, the emerging reactions for diagnosis of, among the public of some of not just the falling birth rate, but some of these broader issues that Carl was discussing? I think what Carl mentioned that's happening in Korea is also taking place in Taiwan. Some of the men in their 20s, they are saying they they are making misogynist comments about how women want um, the, 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 kind, the kind of um, uh, uh, relation, the, the, they, they, they want too much independence and they are very picky on men and they ask for a lot in, in a relationship and they only want the things that's good for them and they never consider like what men's situations are like. If you look at these, um, uh, what's that, the bulletin BBS system, I don't know whether you know it, it's like a, it's like a <laughs> online chatting forum where people exchange comments. They were, there are discussions about this. I don't know how big of a po population there is, but it it, it it exists. It's not like it's it's not like what Carl feel like not taking place in Taiwan. It 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 is it, also happening in Taiwan. So then there are also women who think that men, in, um, you know, um, they they improved in a way in their um gender idea uh, equality um. I, I um thoughts too slowly and their awareness of more egalitarian relationship is also uh, less than ideal so i think there are some mismatches in their their expectation for 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 an, for an ideal relationship and what a, a good marriage is like and so that's making um you know um a building relationship more difficult but the government is feel like they cannot do anything and so that what they're trying to do is this very old-fashioned way and they even think that what singapore the singaporean government doing is is worth trying you know there's a government funded um event of trying to hooking people up and it's called love boat something so it's like a big scale <laughs> event for for unmarried men and women to meet each other so um so like it there are different places in Taiwan that's also arranging this kind of event. So it's a what, day tour to somewhere, you know, and then you can sign up for the event if you are unmarried and under age 50 or something. But I think the the, the, the problem is deeper than lacking the uh, opportunity to meet the opposite sex or meet a potential partner. It's more a fundamental gender issue, a, a tension between what they want from each other. 
Fascinating. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, Yuan and Stuart, I want to give you a chance to jump in here for some final remarks. Um, I, we, we didn't, we've begun to discuss the comparative element, um, but I want to give you a chance to discuss that as well as we finish up. Uh, so Yuan, we'll start with you. Uh, back to Carl's fear and Alice's comment about um, the state-led uh, matchmaking or marriage um, sorting. Um, so we know during revolutionary times, um, the CCP had the tradition of matching cadre, um, party cadres and uh, military cadres with young progressive um, women who, um, so it has always been in the repertoire um, of, um, of a, as, as a strategy. And I think one thing that I want to kind of end on is as we think about China in transition, as we think about China, you know, 40 years of market reform, the one of the weakening is the weakening roles of Dan Wei. So in Dan Wei used to be this place where it provides all this all all encompassing social welfare um, that has all the tentacles in the family life. So right now we are in some way entering into this uncharted territory in which we still have this state with a heavy grip, but also with a market or with this sense of a market, the, the neoliberal and the market fundamentalist idea of a lot of the resources and welfare are being relegated through the market forces. And where does Ch Chinese family fall in between as they're caught between, you know, the all encroaching force of the state and the all encroaching force of the market. Um, and where do people see their future lies as they navigate this, these uncertainties, both from state forces and also from market forces? And what decisions are they to be make as they look ahead? Do they imagine a future with certainty or do they imagine a future with precarity? I think population is such a prism through which we can interrogate all these other forces, sometimes difficult to observe in contemporary China behind um, a veil. Thank you, Yuan. And uh, Stuart, I'll turn it to you for some final remarks. Yeah, no, not much to add, really. I think it, uh, I, I think it's, it's really just, again, um, echoing what uh, Yunus said that, you know, if we look around the world, the countries which seem to have the best population policies are the ones where there is no population policy. It just lets population do its thing, right? It lets people get on with it and people make their decisions and the government tries to stay out of that as, as far as possible. And um, and a part of that is actually um, trust about trust and trust in people and their instincts and their decisions and, and actually observing that what people want quite often, if not almost all the time, actually aligns with what employers want and what governments tend to want, right? People want to actually have... It's, there's not a lot of evidence that people have completely given up on the idea of marriage, right? There's not a lot of evidence to say that people have completely given up on the idea of childbearing. People want to get married. People want to have children. Um, people want to be in stable relationships. People want to work. People want to be a want to have a a, 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 a satisfying you know to contribute as much as they can to society to release their full potential right to to have a, a good work and family balance right so actually those desires are actually aligned um, but I think that it's it's a difficult situation and and it's not just China but across you know the developmentalist welfare states which saw family, you know, the, the, manip the control of population, the manipulation of, of population and the control of the family as a means to an end. In China, it's, it's the most extreme, we would say, but this is something which you see throughout the region, that the, 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 control, the, the management of human capital, of the, of the population, of, of the health and the education of everybody was in service to the state and was in service to economic development. And so now across, and that's why, and then the family is left alone with no support. So that's why we stopped with these very low fertility rates. And it's this 180 degree switch 
is not really working across the region. And it's not working because it's still got this top-down mentality, which worked in the past, in a kind of modernist past, where everybody is more or less going in the same direction. Now we're in a postmodern present and a postmodern diverse future with very, very different approaches, attitudes, um, uh, expectations and hopes. And unless we go with that and we build a bottom up approach, I think it's going to be hard to see how um, any any family policies are going to be successful. Thank you, Stuart. That's a really good note to end on. In a sense, I like your I like your comment that the most successful population is no population policy <laughs> as policy um, and letting people make their own decisions. But I think that one really big takeaway that I'm um, drawing from today's conversation is that it's not enough to focus on a falling birth rate when we're looking at China's demographic picture. We have to, and Beijing has to recognize and address the broader dynamics, gender equality, work-life balance, professional expectations, the pressures that young women and men face in China that will affect their decisions to have children. And I'm really grateful to our four panelists for such a scintillating conversation. This is a topic that's so interesting. I think it really Im will impact China's future. Um, and it will be interesting to see how Beijing addresses it going forward. And I hope in general um, that maybe we'll see a course correction from what Carl was saying, because that's not a great direction. Um, but thank you so much to you four. Thank you so much to our audience who has tuned in today. You can find uh, the four documents that we've translated on the uh, website for this event, but also our website for Interpret China. And I hope you've learned as much as I have and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.